Hi everyone. Before we start, could you please take a second to like this video? It really helps the algorithm to recommend my videos to more viewers like you. And if you enjoy the content, consider subscribing to the channel for more. Your support means a lot to me. Thank you. I sit in my car at a rest stop off the interstate, staring blankly out the windshield as the cold rain pelts down. I should get going, but I can't seem to make myself turn the key. My mind keeps drifting back to that night. The night everything changed. Ever since Janie left, taking our daughter with her, life has felt like a waking nightmare that I can't escape from. The loneliness is suffocating, an endless void that swallows me whole. I drink too much, sleep too little. I'm just going through the motions, haunted by memories of my failures as a husband and father. I pull my hood up as I finally force myself out into the downpour, heading inside to use the restroom and grab some coffee, anything to delay getting back on the road a little longer. As I stand at the urinal, I notice something scrawled on the stall door. Death is coming. I snort humorlessly. If only death would come for me and end this suffering. Back at my car, I sit staring at the thermos of stale, bitter coffee. Too lost in the pit of my depression to even drink it. That's when I see him. A man frantically waving his arms to get my attention from up the road. He's soaked to the bone, clothes clinging to his skinny frame. Despite my apathy, some deep-seated human instinct kicks in and I motion for him to get in. As he climbs into the passenger seat, my eyes drift to the stained shirt stretched tight across his abdomen. Oh God. Blood. So much blood. Before I can process what's happening, he turns toward me with a wild, desperate look in his hollow eyes. Drive! He screams. Just fucking drive! Every fiber of my being is telling me to kick him out, but something about the sheer primal terror etched across his face paralyzes me. My hands are shaking as I throw it into gear and peel out, tires kicking up sheets of rainwater. Where to? I manage to stammer out. He keeps darting panicked looks out the rear window as he barks, Anywhere! Just get us away from here! I should demand some answers, but the intensity radiating off this man is enough to render me mute. After what feels like an eternity of tension-laden silence, he finally starts to relax a little, shoulders slumping forward as the adrenaline seems to drain from him. You probably think I'm some kind of maniac, he mutters, more to himself than me. Maybe I am. Maybe we all are deep down. In that moment, he reminds me so much of myself lately, wildly adrift, drowning in existential despair. What happened? I hear myself asking, my voice sounding distant. He lets out a hollow chuckle and shakes his head slowly. You don't want to know, friend. You really don't. But a part of me did want to know. Something to distract me, if even for a moment, from my own all-consuming misery. Try me, I reply, surprising myself with the sudden hardness in my tone. He fixes me with an unsettling stare, as if trying to look through me, to judge whether I'm worthy of hearing his tale. I had a wife, beautiful girl, kind soul, we had a little boy, he was my whole world, you know? He pauses, breath hitching in his throat as emotion flickers across his gaunt features. About a year ago, we were coming back from visiting her parents. My Laura was puking every few miles, influenza had been going around, I was so focused on getting her home quickly, I didn't see the pickup blow through that light. He draws a long, shuddering breath as tears well up in his eyes. I woke up in the hospital three days later. They had to tell me my wife was dead. My son, too. One heartbeat away from both of them and I couldn't protect them. An icy chill washes over me at the desolation, the hopelessness saturating every word. All I can think about is how I failed Janie and Sarah, too. Let my vices, my weakness, destroy any chance we had at happiness. After that, I just... I couldn't go on living. Not really. I lost everything, piece by piece. My job, my home, my will to live. I started taking any job I could get under the table. Didn't matter what. As long as it helped me stay numb. At a red light, he lifts his shirt to reveal a long, jagged scar across his abdomen. Tried to end it all once. But even that I failed at. Some part of me still too cowardly to go through with it. I shudder at how intimately I understand that gnawing voice of self-loathing in the back of his mind. The seductive whispers trying to convince you you're better off dead. That inner demon that kept dragging me down into the bottle time and again. Recently, I got into some trouble. Ran up debts to some bad men. They weren't keen on letting me off the hook easily. 
He smiles bitterly at this. Wouldn't have minded if they'd put me out of my misery. But no, they decided to make an example out of me instead. My breath catches in my throat as he slowly lifts his gory shirt to reveal a deep, gaping wound just above his pelvis. There's more where that came from if I don't get squared away soon. That's why I need to keep moving. Stay off their radar. A heavy silence falls over the car then. The only sounds the thrum of tires on wet pavement and our jagged breathing. Finally, I chance a look over at him. There's an almost childlike vulnerability behind those hollow eyes now, as if he's just now realizing how much he's divulged to a total stranger. That's when I see the glint of steel peeking out from beneath his shirt. I tense up, cursing myself for being so naive as to pick up a hitchhiker, especially one covered in blood. In one sickening rush, all my repressed fears and anxieties about getting in over my head with the wrong sort come boiling to the surface. He must sense the shift in my demeanor as his face clouds over with shame and resignation. With surprising swiftness, he unbuttons his shirt to expose the hunting knife tucked into the waistband of his jeans. It's not what you think. I'm not here to hurt you, I swear it. I just need to get as far from that sick shit as I can. I want to believe him, but the damage has been done. This poor, tormented soul has gone through hell, yes. But that knife is confirmation that he's capable of terrible things too perhaps even more so now that he's been stripped of his humanity. My only thought is getting this nightmare as far away from me as possible. Clearing my throat, I motion out towards the horizon. Next town over, there's a gas station just off the exit, according to the signs. I can drop you there, then you'll be on your own. Fair? The moment the words leave my mouth, I can feel the air thicken with tension, his eyes narrowing. After what seems like an eternity, he gives a terse nod of assent. We ride in fraught silence, the horror of the situation seeming to dawn on him just as it did me. The trust between us has been irreparably shattered by paranoia and fear. Finally, I spot the garish green sign for the gas station looming ahead. As I peel off the interstate, he speaks in barely more than a hoarse whisper. Look, man, I get it. You got your own mess to deal with. You didn't sign up for my bullshit, too. I'm sorry for dragging you into this. I open my mouth to reply, but the words won't come. What can I possibly say to convey the soul-rending melancholy, the utter desolation his story has reawakened within me? The part of me that sometimes wishes I had the courage to end my suffering for good, rather than perpetuating this half-life I've resigned myself to? As I pull up to the pump, I feign checking my phone, pretending to send a text so he doesn't suspect my real plan. Hey, can you run inside and grab me a pack of smokes while you're in there? I ask as nonchalantly as I can manage. Gotta get my nicotine fix. His back is turned as he opens the door, haltingly lifting himself out of the car with obvious pain. In that moment, a part of me wants to stop him, to take back what I'm about to do. But auto-hypnosis has already taken over, distancing me from the reality of what I'm about to do as a means of self-preservation. Then just like that, he turns and heads towards the gas station, leaving me behind in uneasy silence once more. As soon as he's through the doors, something snaps inside me and I peel out in a spray of gravel with shaking, white-knuckled hands. In the rear view, his solitary figure is receding in the distance. Just another emotionally crippled wretch like me, consigned to wander this mortal plane as the living dead. Even now, hours later, I can't shake the disquieting ambiguity of whether I made the right call or damned myself. I just hope he can survive long enough to find some solace, some inner peace, something I've seemingly lost the capacity for. I have a decent job, um, a small circle of friends, and a comfortable, if unremarkable, routine. But lately I've been struggling with a bout of existential dread and disconnect that keeps me up most nights. I've always been a bit of a loner and an overthinker. As a kid, I got pretty badly bullied, which left me with some self-esteem issues I'm still working through. I had a hard time making friends and relating to others my age. Even now, I find most social interactions deeply draining and uncomfortable. I tend to analyze and second-guess every word that comes out of my mouth, worried that I'll say the wrong thing and be rejected yet again. My last relationship ended over a year ago after my girlfriend Jessica grew frustrated with my emotional unavailability. She's probably right. I do have trouble opening up and being vulnerable, a self-defense mechanism from years of being made fun of as the weird, introverted kid. We tried counseling for a while, but my walls stayed firmly up. One day, Jessica told me she couldn't keep beating her head against the barrier anymore, and that was that. 
So these days I spend most of my free time alone, dwelling on the big questions and my own inadequacies. What's my purpose? Why is human existence so fleeting and seemingly meaningless? How can I connect with others in a deeper way? The thoughts just keep swirling in my head, leaving me feeling increasingly isolated, depressed, and disconnected from reality. On the night this all started, I was driving back to my apartment around 11 p.m. after grabbing a late dinner. It had been a typically mundane, solitary evening, microwaved meal in front of the TV, punctuated by long stretches of scroll-induced numbness looking at other people's carefully curated social media lives. I was stopped at a traffic light on a darkened side street, maybe a mile from my place. Glancing idly out the window, I noticed a figure standing unnaturally still on the sidewalk. Just a vague silhouette, unmoving. Probably a vagrant or something, I thought, not paying it much mind. But then, the light turned green, and as I pulled away, I could have sworn I saw the figure's head turn sharply in my direction, almost mechanically. An involuntary shiver went down my spine. I looked again in the rearview mirror, but it was gone. Unnerved, I drove the rest of the way home, locking the car doors a little more forcefully than necessary. I'd experienced my fair share of paranoia and existential spiraling before, but there was something about that lone, eerie presence that really stuck with me. Over the next few nights, kept seeing that same ominous figure out of the corner of my eye as I drove familiar routes around the city. First, it was lurking in a shadowy doorway as I passed an abandoned building, then pressed up against a chain-link fence behind a closed convenience store, and again, frozen on a street corner in a residential neighborhood, face utterly obscured. No matter where I went or what route I took, that faceless figure would suddenly materialize, unmoving, as if willing me to acknowledge its disturbing presence. My chest would tighten with dread every time. I'd slam the accelerator, passing whatever new nightmarish spot it had chosen as swiftly as possible. Each time I'd try convincing myself it was just my imagination, a figment of my own lonely psyche projecting threats onto the blank canvas of the night. But it started feeling too persistent, too real to be mere delusion. I knew I should tell someone, but what could I even say? That I kept seeing the same ominous silhouette stalking me around the city, despite there being no logical pattern or discernible motive. I already struggled with being seen as the weird, unstable loner. This would only confirm everyone's assumptions. As the daylight encroached, my nightly vigils would recede to the back of my mind like a feverish nightmare upon waking. I'd convince myself it was just my overactive imagination getting the best of me again. But then, night would inevitably fall. And with it, the dread would come creeping back filling every shadow and darkened corner with silent, horrific potential. Last night was the worst yet. I took a shadowy back street after getting stuck in some construction traffic trying to shave a few minutes off my commute. As I turned down the desolated road, a lone streetlight illuminated that all-too-familiar silhouette maybe 50 yards ahead, perfectly still as a statue. Despite every instinct screaming at me to turn around, to get the hell out of there, I kept inching forward, some awful magnetic pull drawing me onwards. As I approached, the light fell fully onto its figure, revealing nothing. No discernible features at all, just a vaguely humanoid darkness, like a living hole had been raggedly torn out of the world. That's when it saw me, or at least seemed to. The featureless void of its head turned with a series of stilted, cracking movements, like it was composed of shattered bone shards held together by black ooze. A primordial shudder of pure revulsion ripped through my being. This thing wasn't natural. It defied all known reality. I finally regained just enough control over my body to slam the gas pedal. My tires screeched as I tore past the abomination, but I could feel its eyeless non-gaze piercing into the back of my skull like nihilistic laser beams. I broke every speed limit getting back to my apartment where I remained barricaded at the time of this writing. No way to explain or even process what the F is happening. All I want is for the nightmares to end. For someone, anyone to wake me up from this waking cosmic horror. I'm a truck driver. This was just supposed to be another long haul, but it turned into something. Disturbing that I can't seem to make sense of. Something that replays in my mind like a haunting never to be explained. I've been driving big rigs cross-country for about eight years now, ever since I got out of the Marines. This life of near-constant motion suits me. 
After the regimented discipline of the Corps, there's something freeing about just getting behind the wheel and letting the road unspool endlessly ahead of me across the vast American expanses. Of course, it's a lonely existence too, which is something I've had to make peace with after my divorce a few years back. My ex-wife Amanda said I was always either physically away working insane hours, or emotionally distant and closed off even when I was home. Maybe she was right. Civilian life is harder for some of us transitioning out of the military mindset. In any case, this particular haul had me hauling a load of car parts from Detroit down to San Antonio. A pretty standard Midwest to Southwest run for me. I set off on my route planning to make it down to Tulsa by the end of the first day of driving. For the first few hours, everything was totally routine. I zoned out to the familiarly rhythmic drone of the engine and the endless blacktop spooling by, letting my thoughts wander aimlessly. That's when the strange sound caught my ear. A faint, muffled sort of cry, barely audible over the ambient road noise. I felt a shiver run down my spine before I could pinpoint what it was. At first, I dismissed it as some stray noise from the truck itself, or maybe just an audio illusion caused by highway hypnosis. But it came again a few minutes later, slightly louder and more insistent. It sounded like... A woman crying? No, more of a muffled wail. Now I was thoroughly unnerved. I looked around the cab instinctively, but saw nothing out of the ordinary. Heart racing, I started pulling over to the shoulder to investigate. As I slowed down, the eerie noise grew even clearer. It seemed to be coming from the trailer behind me. Like someone, or something, was trapped back there amidst the cargo. My respirations kicked into a higher gear as a cold spread of dread gripped me. What the hell could be making that sound? I didn't see anything loaded that could be alive, or... I engaged the parking brake and killed the engine. In the silence that fell, I could make out the muffled sound with disturbing clarity now. It was the unmistakable sound of a woman sobbing. Or was it wailing? Hard to tell because of the enclosed distortion. With shaking hands, I checked that my tire iron was within reach, just in case. Taking a deep breath to brace myself, I disengaged the lock and pulled up the trailer door. The cargo area was dimly lit from the outside, but everything looked normal at first glance. Just stacked pallets and boxes of car parts like the manifest said. Yet that unearthly keening persisted throwing my nerves into even deeper unrest. Hands still trembling, I carefully made my way inside and started checking each pallet, terrified of what I might find. After clearing almost half the trailer, I paused to catch my breath and consider that maybe this whole thing was just a sick prank. That's when my roving flashlight beam caught it, a scrap of fabric peeking out from behind one of the boxes near the front. As I pulled it out, the high-pitched crying sound suddenly resolved into coherence. Oh God, oh God, no. It was a woman's voice, weeping in ragged gasps of uncontainable anguish and horror. I recoiled, feeling like I'd been plunged into ice water. That heart-rending voice was coming from a bundled piece of cloth. No, not cloth. Some tattered piece of clothing, stained and reeking of putrid odors even worse than what you'd find in a trailer full of road-rotted meat. My instinct was to drop it and run, but some deeper curiosity forced me to start pulling aside the knotted fabric. As it unfurled, my stomach heaved at the unmistakable sight and stench of decaying human remains. Whoever, or whatever this had been, they were already long dead. But trapped in that hellish latticework of rags and ligaments was the desiccated remains of what appeared to be a woman, contorted in an endless rictus of agony. I stumbled backwards, gagging at the noxious miasma as a primal scream of revulsion built in my throat. Finally, I turned and hurled chunks of my last meal onto the trailer floor. Only then did the noise finally cease, leaving my world consumed in a cacophony of panicked gasps and wretches. After an eternity of riding out my body's convulsions, I finally forced myself to confront the horror before me again. That's when I noticed the tattered piece of fabric still weakly emitting a muffled cry. My blood instantly went to ice in my veins as the realization percolated. Those anguished wails weren't coming from the human remains after all. They were coming from somewhere else inside the trailer's cargo. I didn't know whether to collapse in despair or frenzy of self-preservation, but the thought of another tortured victim trapped in here somewhere snapped me into frantic motion. I frantically began tearing through everything, upending pallets and ripping apart boxes like a madman. The putrid stench and distorted cries echoing through the small space quickly warped into a nightmarish soundscape unlike anything I could comprehend. Just as the wave of terror crested to unbearable levels, the noise abruptly cut off. 
Silence crashed over me again like a suffocating presence. When I turned, I saw one of the unmarked boxes in the corner had its lid slightly ajar. My heart thudded with dread, yet I felt an inexorable pull guiding me towards it. Every instinct screamed at me to stop, to flee this cursed place, and salt the earth behind me. But some deeper primal drive pushed me forward until I was crouched beside the box, hands trembling as I reached for the lid. But just as I grasped the edge, the box started moving. Not sliding across the floor, but subtly shifting and pulsing like it had developed its own grotesque musculature. Revulsion exploded through my nervous system and I scrambled backwards, screaming incoherently in primal panic. The box, or whatever ungodly presence animated it now, matched my frantic movements as it seemed to unfurl towards me. I closed my eyes and wept as a cacophony of anguished howling voices erupted around me, echoing off the trailer's metal walls. Not human voices, yet undulating with unmistakable timbre of mortal suffering. I'm not sure how long I cowered there, lost in terror and delirious grief. At some point the trailer door was open, and I could see the first faint tendrils of dawn starting to crest over the horizon outside. I blinked against the harsh sunlight as my senses slowly rejoined reality. The trailer was just as I'd last seen it, mundane freight scattered everywhere atop a sheen of my own sickly vomit. And at the center of it all, one unremarkable box sat closed and undisturbed. Something about it still radiated an aura of menace. But for whatever horrific secret it contained, the only sound was the sudden roar of the desolate West Texas wind whistling through the trailer's open doorway, 